It is with great pleasure I welcome Paola Cabal as our first speaker this spring in our Visiting Artist Series. Born in Bogota, Colombia, Paola has lived in Chicago since 2001. A site-specific installation art, Cabal is best known for her rigorous observational studies of daylight over time, movements the artist photographs on site, then paints directly into spaces, Trump Loyal style, using spray paint. As an artist and educator, Cabal is interested in the intersection between physics and perception and co-teaches a course called Articulating Time and Space alongside astrophysicist Catherine Schaefer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Cabal has received a fellowship from the Illinois Arts Council, an individual artist award from the Richard H. H. Dryhouse Foundation, a joint commission for the Chicago Transit Authority and the Department of Cultural Affairs and special events and a residency at Chicago Cultural Center. She has been featured in articles for Chicago Women Magazine, F News Magazine, and the Chicago Sun-Times. Recent reviews of her work can be found in the Chicago Tribune, Art News Online, and New City Art. Later this afternoon, Paola will lead a workshop with our drawing students, focusing on capturing and mapping cast shadows as the basis for drawing, painting, and site-specific work. Using light-sensitive paper, in combination with objects, students will work with Paola to map multiple shadow positions through a combination of photography and drawing. Please help me welcome Paola to our school. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for um, joining me today. Um, I am, it's it's so fun to, I don't know if you, you're sort of projecting yourself into the space that I'm standing in right now and asking yourself self, what is it like to give an artist talk? It's fun because it makes you think about what are the threads that sort of connect what you've been doing and thinking about? What are some of the commonalities between what you're doing right now and what you did a long time ago? Um, I'm going to sort of explore some of those threads now and I can articulate some of them. We can sort of pick back up. You can see where they sort of pick up um, light and shadow, close observation. That's a really important one. Close observation. Through the discipline, in my particular case of painting and drawing, I was in a uh, undergrad. I was a very rigorous, tight realist. I wanted everything to look identical to the thing I was looking at. So that tight observational practice has really continued to be a feature in my work, but it has sort of driven um, different kinds of art making that aren't exclusively sort of like a two or two dimensional discrete surfaces that sort of hang on the wall. Um, collaboration has been really important to bump my ideas up against other people's brains and see what happens when those ideas get transformed by contact with another person. Um, observation, collaboration, and certainly, I think a certain amount of contemplation, like memory, um, loss. Those are things that sort of filter in and inform the work. What I am thinking about when I'm thinking about loss too, in an experiential sense, is I'm thinking about things that exist in the world like smoke or fog or light, that you see it, that you know for sure there's smoke or there's fog or there's light, but you can't touch it. And I want to kind of make things corporeal and material and physical, even if it can't be touched. I want to make it touchable. That's one of sort of the threads that I've been thinking about that sort of connects what I do. So without further ado, I'll kind of make my way through um, this, this particular piece that's on the screen right now was the genesis of everything. Before making this piece, which I had to do, it was a requirement to graduate. You had to do a public art project. Many of my cohort, I remember feeling indignant that many of my cohort decided that they were going to cop out on the public art project and, you know, photocopy a bunch of flyers and kind of guerrilla post them around. Um, and that was their public art project. And I was like, no, I want to make it meaningful. I want to do a thing that really kind of correlates to what I'm thinking about. So this wall, uh, the Center for Personal Development, was on my route. I went to undergrad at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. So this photo was taken in Pittsburgh. And there was like a little shuttle that would get, take you from the campus to like various parts, various neighborhoods. I was living off campus. And um, so this wall was on my shuttle route. And I was really kind of banging my head against what am I going to do to fulfill this public art requirement that I have to do for graduating? Um, and I took an incomplete in that class um, because... I didn't have a good answer for that question, but this wall was on my route every night. And that's kind of another thread that's going to connect here too. 
that commute, the notion of like the thing that you see every day finally becoming your work or the space between things becoming your work. Um, so this wall was on my shuttle route and I was staring at it every day, asking myself, self, what is a mural that would be meaningful for this wall that would be like just the best public art project that would go on this wall? Because this wall was one of those walls that people tag and then, you know, the city comes and they paint like a square over the tag and it would kind of, was like jacked looking. It wasn't that exciting of a wall. It, it was like definitely nobody was going to, you know, put up a fight if I said, I have this great proposal for a mural. They would be like, yes, please come paint your mural here. And it was one night that I realized, oh, there's already a painting on this wall. It just has to be made. There's already one there. The street light across the street was taking these trees that were part, that were planted on the sidewalk and it was throwing those tree shadows on the wall. I was like, I'm just going to paint those shadows, lol. Like that was cracking me up. And I think that that's kind of a good reason to make a thing. Like it makes you laugh, do it. Right? So I take this, I take this idea to my dean. I'm like, so these shadows land on this wall and I, I want to paint them to, so they can be permanent. And he laughed and he's like, take all my money. Like, so the Carnegie Mellon kind of like gave me money and then another faculty member gave me scaffolding and the, and the whole community kind of came together. The Center for Personal Development was like, yes, do your thing. And so it was in the early spring when I traced out the tree's shadow that was landing on the wall from the street light across the street. And it was, so the trees hadn't come into their leaves yet. So it was kind of tree skeletons, right? A little emo looking, kind of like a, I don't know, Edgar Allan Poe or something. And um, what happened that I, I, honestly, I didn't think about this, but it was one of those things like I had to own it after the fact. What happened is that, of course, in the spring, the trees grew into their foliage, right? And the shape of the shadow changed that was thrown on the wall. The shape of the shadow grew. And so what ended up getting generated was a visual record of the tree's growth over time, right? There is the springtime tree and then the shadow filled out kind of this record of growth. And it was oddly perfect because the Center for Personal Development was a not-for-profit organization oriented towards getting adults with disabilities to be able to lead more independent lives. That was what the Center for Personal Development was about. So that I had created a record of growth on their wall inadvertently it was perfect. It was a perfect match of mural and venue. And I ended up winning a really prestigious award uh, in Pittsburgh. The Carnegie Museums of Art and Natural History have something called the Carnegie Centennial Award that recognizes outstanding contributions toward community improvement in the arts. And um, I was awarded that. And I, it's, I, I love telling this story because I interned at the Carnegie International as a sophomore, okay? I, it was slave labor, okay? It was fully volunteer. I was like running around making copies and fact checking and copy and like spell checking and finding mistakes in the catalog. And Paola Morciani was the assistant curator. And Paola Morciani says to me, Paola, what do you think would be adequate recognition? You know, we can't pay you. But what do you think would be adequate recognition for all the work that you put in as an intern at the Carnegie Museums? And I was like, Paula, I think I should get free museum admission for life. And she laughed. She was like, ha, that's funny, Paula. No. I was like, how is that hard? I don't understand. Like, I just volunteered. I busted my butt for you guys. Free museum admission. What? And she was like, no. Um, and then I win this Carnegie Centennial Award that comes with free museum admission for life. I was like, thank you. Vindication. So um, that was 1998, and I hadn't thought about shadows before that time. That was my senior year of undergrad. Um, so this piece, which is called Support System, is from grad school. I'm thinking about shadows again. And again, I'm thinking about nighttime shadows. One of the things that I noticed coming here in Chicago was that there's scaffolding on a lot of buildings. This particular map, mapped shadow, is from some scaffolding that was set up on Adams and Clark Street downtown. And I noticed all these street lights from different positions making crisscross shadows on the walls of the building on the on the sidewalk. So I took 
photo backdrop paper, which is a cheap, non-archival, very big roll of paper. And I took it to that scaffolding site. I hooked it up to the scaffolding and unrolled it down onto the sidewalk and then out onto the sidewalk. And I took photographs of how it landed on the paper. And I also made a pencil tracing of how it landed on the paper. And I used my photos and my pencil tracing to create this piece called support system, which is not supportive at all. It's very floppy. Um, it's about 30 feet wide. It goes eight feet up on the wall and it comes eight feet out onto uh, the ground. And it, like, I, there's a kind of Dr. Seussian fascination about now I can take my shadow and roll it up and I can put it anywhere I want. Um, so trying to make the shadow corporeal and physical and even sort of uh, transposable was the interest in this particular instance. This is the first time I did sunlight. This was my MFA thesis piece from graduating the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. That was in 2003. And I did not yet have a system set up for tracing shadows that move. That was a trick because I was like, cool, I've done this a few times now with, sh with shadows cast from streetlights. I know what I'm doing. And then I started tracing out the sunlight that hit the wall and the floor in chalk and it moved so fast. I had to like hustle, 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 and then stop. And then hustle, 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 and then stop. Reason being that I was doing it at 15 minute intervals, this tracing. So what you're seeing here is a wall and sort of that window in this space faces west. The first sunlight that comes into that space comes in at 1.30 in the afternoon and just makes a little tiny sliver on the wall and the floor. And then the next sunlight that comes in, um, that kind of little sliver grows into more of a triangle shape and so on. It kind of makes its way up the wall. And what you finally see up the wall is that you see the sun setting behind a building across the street. This was on West Jackson Boulevard and the building across the street obstructed the sunlight. And so that's what you see mapped on the wall. Um, one of my questions here wasn't just, can I make sunlight corporeal? Although I'm interested in that. I wanted to know all the sunlight that comes into a space at one time. I wasn't okay with just, here's the sunlight that lands in this space. Let me map that sunlight. I wanted all the sunlight at once, the whole day at the same time. Um, and because the sunlight only came in in the afternoon, essentially I have an afternoon's worth of sunlight. The thesis exhibition was April, so I wanna say that I mapped this around the end of the first week of April, so a little ways after the equinox. Um, here's my friend Shira standing in the piece for scale, so you can see how big she is versus how big the piece is. And that was my first ever sunlight piece. I've since come up with a different protocol that I'll show you the process. I have some process images. The next thing, that was 03. The next thing that happened was a piece at this gallery called, um, it was like on May Street. It was uh, a gallery on May Street. And it's no longer, the reason I'm like forgetting, it's no longer in existence. But it was a really huge, beautiful space, 42 feet wide, the wall. It's about 22 feet high. And I was asked to participate in this exhibition um, called Lighten Up um, at this gallery on May Street, which is uh, in the West Loop. And it was kind of like a garden level gallery. So it was like, there's a, a mezzanine and you had to walk down into it. And I was excited to participate. I was like, of course I will do, you know, a sunlight study in this exhibition. And then I went to the venue and lo and behold, there's no windows in the space. Um, so what I ended up doing, which is some, a strategy that I've actually deployed several times since, is building a scale model of the gallery space and taking my scale model. And if you look at this, let's see if I can point it out right here. If you see this, it used to be a window. It's cinder blocked out now, but it used to be a window. All right, and this is, this right here, that's the loading dock to get into the space. So what I did with my scale model is I cut out the doors of the loading dock. I cut out that cinder block window. That's actually a symmetrical situation. There's another cinder block window on the other side. And I um, oriented my scale model outside to get sunlight as if I had opened the windows back up again, even though I hadn't done. So I ended up calling this piece the wrong cathedral. I was sleep deprived and this faculty 
came in that had been my advisor from Carnegie Mellon. And she's like, what you're doing mapping this, it's like the Rouen Cathedral. And I was like, the what? The Rouen Cathedral. And I heard wrong cathedral. I'm like, I'm going to call my piece that. It's the wrong cathedral now. So I'm mapping all the sunlight that would have come into the space if it could have come into this space, but it does not come into the space. But it is true to orientation. The windows do face west, and this is light coming in from the west into the space. My favorite comment on this piece is viewers came to the opening of the show, and they were like, oh, I can't wait to come back and see what it looks like tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, let, let me know. I want, I want to know what that experience is like. Um, so here's another sort of iteration of my investigations into light and shadow. I'm curious about how street light falls into a space. And we're in a really interesting moment right now. The city of Chicago is replacing all those orange halide lights. Those orange, orange lights are getting swapped out for LEDs. And the LEDs are a cooler colored light. They have a better color rendering index. But some people are like missing. They're nostalgic for their orange light. So there's like a little bit of like disagreement over like, do we like these new lights? They save us energy, but they're kind of cold. Um, so this was at the Northeastern Illinois University Gallery when it was in the River North. This was on Superior Street in the River North. It was on the second floor above Jean Albano Gallery, if you're familiar with um, the galleries over in the River North. And this, again, was a, an exhibition I was asked to participate in. I go to the venue. There's no open window daylight coming into the space at all. And I had never had this happen, but actually the curator, who is Ed Maldonado, had the drywall taken out from in front of the windows and he built me this wall that you're seeing. This, this wall that's vaguely purple in color um, was a wall that was built for the purposes of my studying how does the light come into this space at night. I was like, wow, red carpet treatment. Um, there's a few different light sources for this. Obviously, you see that orange um, light. That's the closest street light and the most distinct. But then there's also this building across the street that's kind of throwing some light on the floor. And then there's a billboard that's further away that's kind of a fluorescent lighting situation. It's throwing some green light on this wall. This piece was called After Hours. And the whole query was, once you turn off, turn off the lights and everyone leaves the gallery for the night, what does that space look like? What, what lands on the wall? What does it register as? Um, and so that's what I was kind of looking at in After Hours. I was trying to sort of replicate in spray paint what that experience would look like. Um, the purple was me shutting off all the lights, hanging out in there, and asking myself, self, if you have a white wall and it's nighttime, what color is that wall when all that's hitting it is kind of all these random amalgam of streetlights? What color is that wall? And I have this weird system that I've come up with. I have this fan deck from, it happens, it's not a Pantone fan deck, it's a Benjamin Moore fan deck. And I kind of flip through my fan deck and I kind of hold color chips up to walls and I kind of look and squint my eye and I see, does this color chip match this wall? This wall kind of went purple because that strongest light was that orange yellow halide light. Um, and so that's what became the base color for the whole piece. And then the um, additional interventions happened on top in spray paint. So this, this is not painted. What you're seeing here are those wonky, funny reflection patterns that happen when the sunlight hits the glass on a building and it lands on like the wall opposite, right? Those like refraction patterns that you see happen that are really wonderful. So UIC Gallery 400, uh, this was in 2006, and they had a call for entry that I loved the premise of. The premise was pitch us the project that you think that you're gonna have a hard time getting funded. I was like, oh, I got a few of those. <laughs> and so this particular one was inspired by me riding the CTA train and the sunlight bouncing off the windows of the CTA train and the light from the CTA train windows kind of like snaking along the buildings as I rode. Um, but I expanded that inquiry because I ultimately wanted to do, and this is another kind of thread in my presentation before I forget, what you're going to see here is many like threads of inquiry that like I have plans to follow up on more, but I haven't done yet. Um, 
I ultimately decided I wanted to do a three-part intervention. I wanted to look at how the light bounces off of buildings and lands on other stuff, right? So it's not direct sunlight now, it's reflected sunlight. I wanted to look at, so from a moving object onto a still object, like from the CTA train onto buildings, and then I wanted to do from a still object onto a still object. So this is the shed aquarium, right? The sunlight is bouncing off the shed aquarium windows and it's landing on that shed aquarium wall. So that's static to static. And then I wanted to do static to moving. Like if a moving truck parks at a building and a reflection pattern lands on the box of the moving truck, I wanna paint the moving truck so that it like drives away with the reflection still attached. Like that would really make me happy. So I haven't done the moving to static or static to moving part of this. I've only done two interventions that are static to static because those are basically the spaces that I could get like kind of the permission and the funding and all the sort of triangulated components together for. So this is what my intervention ultimately ended up looking like. UIC Gallery 400 was able to get me in-kind donations of custom mixed spray paint for the piece, but not permission, um, which pro tip, wear a fluorescent security vest and go out from the hours of nine to five. And nobody thinks twice about whether you're meant to be there. I had caution tape, I had traffic cones, I was legit. <laughs> so the, the downside is that the, the shed aquarium wall has this like graffiti proofing finish on the concrete. So the the, Spray paint intervention has definitely faded over time, but if you're out there and you're looking for it, you can still see traces of it. This one lasted a little bit longer. It's a little bit more jacked now, but this one was on Canal Street between Harrison and Van Buren. And oh, that old post office threw the best reflection patterns onto this wall. It looks like a music score for piano or like John Cage. I'm not even sure. I love the way that the light makes this wonderful uh, crooked line on this space. So for this one, I did get permission from the city department of transportation. Um, and I set up my traffic cones in my ladder and I was out there in my orange, uh, reflective vest, uh, legitimately. And, um, I, most of the time on this piece was spent fixing that wall. It was in such crap shape. Um, but then I was finally able to kind of map those reflection patterns as they landed onto that wall. It was really satisfying when it was first done. Now, similar to the um, Center for Personal Development, this is one of those walls that people come and tag it, the city comes and paints a real random color. They don't ever seem to concern themselves with matching whatever was there. It's like brown, brown is good today. We have brown in the bucket. Um, so this is all different colors now. I think there's brown and peach on here. There's like random squares on top of this. Um, my friend, the artist, Tony Phillips challenged me. He said, Paula, I pass that piece every day. Now that they have painted those weird graffiti covering squares on that wall, you need to go out and color match how light lands on the graffiti covering squares. I was like, cool tone, I'll get right on it. I like, I legit, I think that would be funny, but I just, I haven't been able to do it yet, but that would be great. So making things corporeal, trying to keep things, one of the hardest things to keep is people. I don't know if y'all have experienced this in your life. Um, these are my two tightest, tightest friends from MFA, all right? In the back standing up, we see Samakshi Singh, and in the front sitting on the bench, we see Gisela Insuaste. And Samakshi Singh, this was 2007, and she was getting ready to move back to New Delhi. And I was like, no! And uh, Gisela Insuaste had been an East Coaster all her life, moved here for grad school, but was getting ready to go back to the East Coast. I'm like, y'all can't leave. That's just how it is. So this was a project space that was attached to Western Exhibitions Gallery. And it's kind of hard to tell, but what I actually, uh, they asked me to come in and do a piece because it was like the middle of winter. They were like, we need some sun up in here. Paola, come do a thing. And I kind of roped Samakshi and Gisela into being these kind of almost like tableau vivant models that had to stay in place and never move. And I painted the walls and the ceiling and I swapped out their canvas curtains for like dyed gray curtains. Everything went like light or medium shades of gray. And that was like my base color. And then if you see the window wells are spray painted, that's not sunlight, that's my spray paint that's uh, in there. And then Samakshi's casting a shadow on that curtain, but that's also spray paint. And then there's spray paint on the floor as well. And I treated their clothes. So the whole premise is like, 
you guys have to stay still. You can't move. And they were not very good at staying still. So Samakshi now is back in New Delhi. Um, Gisela is, she actually is living in the Bay Area now. You can see I painted on their hair and their clothes. The whole premise is like they have to stay still. They can't, they can't leave now. So this is actually, this shot is taken at night um, with only sort of my spray painted interventions standing in as light. And this is in the daytime without my friends there. That's what it looks like in the space. This was um, a day tracing piece looking at all the sunlight that comes into the space over the course of a day. This was commissioned by Carol Becker for her office at Columbia University. So this is like one of the few pieces that I can point to and say, you could just kind of mosey on over to Dodge Hall and um, ask to get let into Carol Becker's office and they will let you in um, if she's not around or holding a meeting. And you can see this piece, it's called Moving in Place. It's because Carol Becker is a cultural theorist and writer. She's amazing if you haven't read her. Um, and she's got this book that I love called Thinking in Place, Art, Action, and Cultural Production. And so as a tribute to her thinking in place, I call this piece Moving in Place. One of the things that you're mapping when you're mapping the entire course of a day into an architectural environment is that you are mapping actually the movement of the earth hurling through space, right? And so that's, we're literally moving in space right now. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to draw attention to, that it's not, as we all know, the sun that's moving, it's us, it's we who are moving. So um, that's what this piece was. Um, over to the right, that sort of little triangular form, that's the first light in the morning. And then in the later afternoon, you can see the color temperature gets a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer as that sunlight climbs up to the right on the wall. And um, that's the sun setting again behind a building across the um, Hudson, right? It's like she's, um, she's facing west, so that main window faces west, and the sun is setting sort of into the Hudson in that wall. Here's another. This is like with her furniture now in it. I think she's kind of changed the configuration around a little bit. I was like low-key um, annoyed because I'm very huh, comprehensive. Like, like, okay, maybe control freak. I'll, I'll take it. But I wanted to paint her ceiling too. And I wanted to paint her window walls. She's like, no, Paula, you can only do the walls. Um, so, yeah. So the fact that the ceiling is white, it irks me irks me. It's not okay. Um, so one of the ways that I've found to kind of augment my ideas and explore what I'm thinking about with other people, um, and one of the benefits of teaching at a specialist school where, yeah, okay, like we, we do, we have to cover basics. We have to cover beginning drawing, but we can also offer really specific topics-based courses, is that um, I can explore these ideas in the context of a class, right? So I pitched a class called Articulating Space. It was a drawing topics class. And it was a summer intensive, a three-week class. And immediately after that class, I knew that I had access to a space in the Pedway below the Cultural Center. Um, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do in the Pedway yet, but I knew that I wanted to do something kind of epic down there. And so as I was teaching Articulating Space, I said to the students, I was like, yo, if you guys... I don't know, like, I respect it. You know, you have jobs, you have other places to be. But if you have time and you want to come and chill in the Pedway and, like, make some work with me, like, come on down. And so who ended up taking me up on the offer were these guys, Mike Genji. He was a designed object student. Um, actually, interior architecture. I'm wrong. And this is Chris Greeshaber. He was a designed object student. And they were the ones who kind of ended up camping out the most with me down in the Pedway. I was kind of thinking, if you look at the Pedway, that's what it looks like. That was what the space looks like. And it looks like that to this day. I think they're using it for something else now. But um, it's kind of a storefront-ish. There's a bunch of storefronts down in the Pedway if you walk underneath those city buildings. And I wanted to maybe set up things that looked vaguely like they were for sale. So I was kind of thinking individual discrete objects. And my whole uh, inquiry that I wanted to think about was if you're selling, for example, I don't know, coffee cups or something, um, I can make it look like it's a coffee cup, but I'm only gonna sculpt part of it. And then like the rest of it is not, is literally not gonna be there. Like it only exists where the light hits it. 
And then like the rest of it isn't there. Like that was my thought. It was like, and it's going to look like it's for sale, but then you approach it and you realize that it's not really there. And Mike and Chris were on board, but they were like, why are you going to do discrete objects? Let's do architecture scale stuff. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. And so what ended up happening is that we deployed some of the skills that they had been learning with their three-dimensional modeling programs and things. We had a space, but and we wanted to fake a stairwell, right? Uh, but we didn't have, like, it wasn't a deep enough space to fake a stairwell. So we ended up drawing it out in Rhino and figuring out, like, how would we have to manipulate the perspective to get this look like a staircase, to look like a staircase, even if it's not a staircase. There's a, a staircase that takes you from Randolph Street down to the South Shore Trains, right? I don't know how familiar you are with this, but bear with me. It's like it's like one of those big wide staircases with like a banister that goes down the middle, right? It takes you from Randolph Street down to the South Shore Trains, and we were going to copy that staircase. And so this is what it ended up looking like. And what was really funny about this, this is made out of paper, and there's like like monofilament fishing line that's kind of like holding the paper in space. So when you just look at it through the glass doors, it looks like there's legit a stairway in there. And so many people in the pedway pushed the door open, convinced they were gonna get up to Randolph Street on that stair, and then stop short. Because wait a minute, this isn't a stairway, this is fake. This is all completely a perspectival manipulation. Um, <laughs> so, here, I, you know, I thought I had, I think it was just kind of like one of those wonderful happenstance situations. Sometimes you get access to a space and you're told, okay, cool, you have this space for four weeks, go nuts, right? Nice. Uh, and so I was getting ready to move out and they're like, wait, Paula, turns out we don't have another person lined up after you. So if you want to just chill in there, you can stay in there. And I ended up being in there from July through like November. I had a pretty long run in this space. And these guys were like not letting up. They were like, oh, we have to do another architectural intervention. And so what they decided they wanted to fake this time was they decided they wanted to fake a subway turnstile. Let's make a subway turnstile, but it's not completely there. It's only there where the light hits it. So here you see the rendering of the subway turnstile, and this is our rendition of it. This time we couldn't get away with just using paper. I was low-key disappointed about it. We had to kind of support it in the back with pink foam to get it to kind of stand up. So it was a little more substantial than I would have liked because the whole point is that it only exists where the light hits it. And if the light doesn't hit it, then it's not there. And paper as a thin membrane accomplished that really nicely. So we did have to end up supporting this a little bit more. I'm gonna give you the sneak peek. Nobody who is in this space got to see it from this angle, but you get to see it from this angle. This is what it looks like from the back. You can kind of see some of that pink foam that supports it. And you can see if you're standing directly in front of that staircase, how it's now messed up. There's only one vantage point that the staircase works, which is the vantage point from looking outside the, uh, into the space. Once you stand directly in front of the staircase, it becomes very apparent that it's fake because it turns in space in that particular way. It's a vantage point specific illusion, essentially in three dimensions. We went on to do more vantage point specific illusions. This is a really funny little closet sized space that used to be run by the painter Candida Alvarez in the Fine Arts Building. It was called Subcity Projects. And if you look at the Fine Arts Building, which is on Michigan Avenue, um, it's got this light well, as many of these old buildings do, before electrical light was kind of bright. They had sort of this dimmer gas light. And they had these light wells in the middle of the building to feed light into those offices. And so we decided to copy what the light well looked like as a vantage point specific illusion. So when you came up to our piece and you pressed your face up to the glass of this little closet sized space, this is what you saw. And if you looked at it, if we opened the door, which it wasn't sort of a, a tended gallery, you would never see it from this angle. But if you did open the door, this is what you would see. It was all completely worked out in Rhino, and then we, would, we laser cut that museum board and mounted lights behind it to replicate what the space would look like um, if you were looking at that light well at night. We also did really ridiculous things. This is not something I, don't, I think I would have ever done as an artist myself, but one of my collaborators came up with it and we decided to run with it. So there's this gallery that used to exist in Pilsen called um, Second Floor Gallery. 
It was run by this guy, Arno Mayorga, who now lives in Austin. And Arno Mayorga has a very eclectic furniture collection, as we're seeing here. He's like a big thrifter. He's a big eBay guy, and he looks for very specific kinds of pieces. And, you know, he'll even modify, paint them, change them up. And so when he asked F Utility Projects, which is my collaborative, the three of us, he said, do you guys want to do a show here at our gallery? And we were thinking, okay, what do we want to do at Arno Space? One of my collaborators, Mike, decided, why don't we put all his furniture on a pedestal? Like, the gallery is the show, is the gallery, is the show. And so we called this piece Gallery Second Floor. We built a pedestal for every single one of Arno's furnishings. And then we like sort of credited it. We figured out, we asked at the Art Institute, we were like, so, you know, if you don't have a specific show for which you're painting a wall, what's your default paint color? And the Art Institute was like, oh, we use Benjamin Moore titanium gray. We're like, noted. So we painted Arno Space titanium gray. We painted the pedestals titanium gray. And we laser cut donor names into the pedestals because like we had to pull in all our friends to help us because this was an insane thing to attempt. And then we even copied their labeling protocol so that the furnishings became the artwork. It was pretty ridiculous. Like, I, I appreciate the ridiculousness because I think I'm a little self-serious, you know? Like, yes, I just said, if it makes you laugh, you should do it, but I don't always take my own advice. So working with these, like, kooky student collaborators got me really out of the, the shell of my own sort of limitations and into a different kind of space. This um, is the last thing I'll show you from F Utility Projects. This is a show that we did at the Glass Curtain Gallery at Columbia College. Justin reminded me, were you there at that time? Um, this piece was called Collaboratory, and it was two collaboratives working together. My collaborative, F Utility Projects, and another collaborative called Ed Jr., and what Ed Jr. Uh, was sort of known for doing was these sort of beautiful meditative videos where you never see them. You just see sh the shadows of bodies and you see lines appearing on paper, like because the whole thing is shot from the other side. Um, and so what we did is that we built all these sort of architectural interventions in the gallery that viewers could then manipulate. Like we wrapped a scrim around a column and you could unwrap the scrim and you could catch the projections that Ed Jr. made in a different way. Um, and it was insane and ambitious and really fun to do. And so that was a collaboratory, which is a two collaborative exhibition that we were part of. So to pivot back to sort of my work, this is, I'm obsessed with parking garages. I don't know why I love them so. There's something really, really fascinating to me about parking garages. This one I'm particularly obsessed with. It's at 3679 North Lakeshore Drive. And um, what I did is I just copied in chalk pastel those little luminous boxes that are part of this space. And that's what became this piece. Um, it's kind of floating on little spacers on the wall. Um, and then this is another parking garage. This is actually a parking garage that I noticed in Streeterville. And the way that I decided to copy this parking garage was that I cut out individual little pieces of paper to look like the perforations of the parking garage and mounted them on the wall. This was called Anthology of Emphases. I'm also still interested in capturing sunlight, but somehow I think I'm maybe like gravitating towards a more material space. This was in 2010 that I had a residency in Mexico. This is what you're seeing is the space that I was in for that residency and how the sunlight came into that space. So I put this sort of narrow uh, swath of nice thick printmaking paper down on the wall and the floor took pictures of how the sunlight landed on there, and then I kind of peeled the whole surface of the paper away to re reveal its fuzzy, fibrous underbelly. And that I, I hit with um, powdered graphite. So where I didn't cut up the paper, it kind of resisted the powdered graphite, and you have the lighter part. And where I did kind of cut away the top layer of the paper, you have that kind of grittier, it kind of captured the powdered graphite better. That's what that piece ended up looking like. It was kind of a reverse process where like uh, in the bottom part, I carved away the shadow. I essentially carved a layer of the paper off, right? And then in the top one, I carved away the windows. Like I treated that whole surface first and then like where you see 
the sort of sunlight, that's the part that's actually been peeled back off of the paper. This is called Analemma, and it was made in 2013 for the Hairpin Art Center, which is in Logan Square, uh, I want to say Diversity Kimball, Milwaukee. Um, I made this piece for a show called The Presence of Absence. And when it came time to deinstall it, I think that nobody realized that maybe there was a piece there. So this piece is like kind of still there in some form. Like people have hung other shows on top of it and stuff. I can't speak to the condition of it, but I think that my sunlight intervention is still there. So analemma is an astronomical term that refers to the way that the Earth tilts on its axis over the course of the year. And an easy way to map analemma, it's like a big hobbyist photography thing. It's like set up your camera on a tripod with a really low aperture and look at the sky at 1030 in the morning right? And then come back two weeks later in the same exact position and point your camera at the sky in the exact same position and see how 1030 changes, right? It makes, it ends up, it's very poetic, it ends up making like this, like figure eight. That's what it does. Depending on where you are in the world, it makes a different direction of figure eight. But that's how the earth tilts on its axis. It's again, an analemma is kind of mapping our motion through space more than we're like you know, I, I say I'm mapping the motion of the sun. The sun is not moving. We are moving. So I'm mapping our motion. Um, this particular analemma is a half year analemma. And this is a thread I want to follow up on because I want to do a full year analemma. I haven't done one yet. The Hairpin Art Center faces southeast. And so at around the beginning of May, the sun stopped coming into the space. There was no sun to map. So I mapped the sunlight coming into the space from January through May, two weeks apart. So what you're seeing is not the tracking of sunlight over the course of a day. You're seeing the tracking over the course of part of a year. That's what an analemma is. This is a proposal drawing. I make elaborate proposal drawings for um, exhibitions. This is one of them. This is for Winter Azimuth at the Elmhurst Art Museum. This is how the piece ended up looking. I mapped the daylight coming into the space over the course of one winter day, and that was my piece. I also put um, f like a floor on top of their floor. They had a black painted wood floor, and they wouldn't let me paint on it, which is cool. Um, so I put on a masonite that was painted the same black as their floor, and I did sunlight intervention onto their masonite floor. You could walk on it. I, I definitely put a, a, a sort of polyurethane on it that made it so that you could walk on the piece. Um, that's what it looks like from the other end of the hallway. This is a proposal drawing. Again, this is something that I want to make and haven't made, which is called Everland Cafe. In Everland Cafe, everything, the table, the chairs, the bowls, the cups, the plates, the forks, the knives, and napkins uh, has permanent shadow on it that looks super real looks super real. But the second you pull your chair away to sit down, for example, the floor still has the shadow from where the chair was, right? So what I did with this proposal drawing is I actually made it so that you could literally move stuff. Like you can take away the cups, the forks, and the plates. So if you pay attention to the cups, the forks, the forks and the plates, pay attention to the chairs, you can take them away from the drawing to see what's left if you take them away or move them. And then here's like, the movable components of that. That's like, I want to make Everland Cafe is like a permanent cafe space. It's just always there. And anytime you come, uh, everything is nicely configured where it's supposed to go. And the second you lift or move it, um, the shadows and the light stay the same, but you've now sort of shifted it off register. Um, I like how that, I don't know, predicates a certain kind of performative behavior from the user, I think. There's like something about that that's kind of rendering you null in a way that I think is potentially really productive. Um, so that's a proposal for something that I haven't made, but I'm like working on it. That's like one of my lifetime pieces that I'm hoping to see happen. So one of the questions I'm asking myself is self, why do you need to map sunlight? Like, what is your thing? Why do you need to like do this? Um, and so synopsis was me trying to figure out the answer to that question. This was also at the Glass Curtain Gallery. And Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, you were still there when we did synopsis, right? For the exhibition Invisible, which was curated by Annie Morse. I remember you helping me set up this projection because it was not easy to do. Um, I, there's spray paint on the floor of the gallery and what you will see, and I'm going to flip through it really fast, is um, there's a bunch of still images. So what I did is I, 
I set up a ladder and my friend Rachel Herman took photographs of me chasing the sunlight across my bedroom floor. And I copied the sunlight from my bedroom floor into the glass curtain gallery. And I projected still images of that sort of performative activity of me chasing the sunlight onto the painted intervention. At one point, my cat gets involved. There's Jeffrey. Jeffrey's no longer with us. So every time the sun would move, I would like take my sheet and move it to match up with the sunlight. It's like, I'm trying to stay warm over here. Um, so that was synopsis. And this is crescent. This is a moonlight mapping. Okay, this is a full moon over the course of an August night. I definitely installed another fake floor over their existing gallery floor. There's a um, baseboard projection that happens in the back space called To and From. On the right-hand side, you see the Riverside Art Center River. You, on the left-hand side, you see the train tracks. And this is what it feels like. So every time I would go out to the Riverside Art Center on the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Metro, I would take my cell phone and take a one-minute video of the tracks. And so what you see looping on the baseboards is every possible ride that you can take on the Burlington Northern Santa Fe composited into one continuous video. We did that in Premiere and shot and projected onto the baseboard of the gallery. Okay, I'm going to kind of flip through the next shovel images very quickly because we're just about at time. This is um, backlight. This space has since been demolished, but this was a gallery space called Demo Projects. They always knew it was going to be demolished. Um, down in Springfield. And this space had, which is not uncommon, this is like a, an issue I've run into even in the course of this lecture, um, people asking me to show, but there's no sunlight that comes into the space. And that's by design because people want to maximize the wall space in their gallery. Makes sense, right? So people often just get rid of windows. That's what happens. They just put drywall or something else. Plywood is over the windows. So this is me restoring the gallery's windows. I didn't actually cut the plywood out of the window. What I did instead was I took high resolution photographs and I built light boxes to the scale of the windows so that now the scene that you would see out of the windows is there all the time, except that it's only there at one time of day. So you get this uncanny incongruity. Like it's like it's one time of day and the second night falls, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and of course, I also painted onto the floor. In this particular case, they let me paint onto the floor to show the sunlight that comes in at the time of day that the photos were taken. That's with the door closed. Articulating time and space, we did an exhibition featuring both student work and professional artist work. That was at the Sullivan Galleries of the School of the Art Institute. Um, these are just some quick shots of some of the different spaces and interventions that people made. This projected video that also had accoutrement that you could modify the light. This rubber band grid that you could step into and stretch out to sort of uh, figure out your position in space and time. This piece is with the lights on. Once I turn the lights off, that's what it looks like. And the whole idea of this piece is that there's this really subtle chiffon piece in there that has almost these constellations of stains and marks, and you're meant to discover them with your flashlight, discussing how you only really know what you yourself get to see from the vantage point of you, right? You never see the whole thing at once. This is Carrie Gundersdorf. Um, she's looking at NASA photography, and she's making paintings and drawings uh, based on that using color pencil and also paint. Stephanie Lee pointed her camera at the same spot in the sky over the course of four weeks. So this is like a four week map of the same spot of sky. It's a video, so you see it change over time. Krista Donner is a professional artist here in Chicago. This is her redistribution of curiosity project, which was uh, paintings and drawings that also became a deck of cards that could kind of be manipulated by the user. This is one of our students calculating the distance in light years between certain points. This is the piece that I did for the CTA. This is on four loop link bus shelters along Washington. And what you're seeing is, so let me back up and say that I had a very sort of proscribed area that I could install into. I was told that my material had to be adhesive vinyl. 
um, which is like what what stores use. Like it's an advertising medium. Like sometimes they cover buses in that adhesive vinyl. You know, are you picturing it? That photographic material that's adhesive. It's like a sticker. So it was only going to be in that material, and it was going to be on these glass panels that are along these bus shelters. Um, and I had to leave. What was it? I could only use 25% of the surface area for safety reasons. Like I can't use more than 25%. You like you have to see, be able to still see through the glass panels. So what I did, um, my working title was 24 hours in Chicago. What I ended up calling it was light scrim. What I did is that I set up cameras and I documented how the light changed over the course of the day. So when you're standing on the platform and you're looking at my printed photographs, my photos match the wall behind it or the sidewalk or whatever's back there, the planners or the bike rack or whatever's back there, right? It matches, but it might not be at the same time of day. So it's vantage point specific. If you stand in the middle of any one of these panels and you look at it, my photos match the scene past it. It's two-sided, so it also works from the sidewalk side. And this is an example of how one of them looks. So this looks like it's going from daytime to nighttime. I'm gonna guess that if you, we look on the left, this column represents um, 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock, 7.30. So this column up and down is 7.30, right? This is 5 o'clock. But you can see that my photo, this is a photo, and this is the bike rack that's actually there. This is my photo. This is the bike rack that's actually there. So my photos are vantage point specifically aligned to the scene out beyond it. I didn't have to install the piece, which was a godsend. Um, but as these things go, it, they become like really popular souvenirs. The city told me not to say that, but I'm telling you. People come over and peel them off all the time. So these things are like halfway gone 90% of the time um, as they stand now. The other person who ended up getting this commission was Christine Tarkowski, and she's on Madison Street. So I have Washington Street, Christine has Madison Street, but Christine did a smart thing and kind of did the 25% as like a linear design that takes up a whole film. So her film isn't separate enough for anyone to peel off is my point. I was like, mm -mm, if I had known. Um, so that's light scrim, and that's up in some form, but like I said, it's kind of a little bit messed up at this point. Um, all right, it looks like I'm running out of time. I want, I do want to tell you about Eclipse though, um, and this will be like, I'll, I'll just end here. So I did a residency in 2016 at Jurassic, which is a residency in the Santa Cruz Mountains, south of San Francisco, and they have this wonderful old barn with all these holes in the roof at Jurassi and the whole point of this old barn, which they wanted to knock down, but apparently the artists like protested, is um, the whole point is like do installations here. And so I saw this old barn and I'm like, oh my God, I have to do an installation here. And so there's 116 holes in the roof. And what I ended up doing is that I ended up covering each one of those holes that let sunlight through with the name laser cut of someone who had been killed by police between Chicago and uh, San Francisco. And actually while I was in residence, two more people were killed by police and it set up like this big protest against the San Francisco Police Department. And so it's called Eclipse. And what I wanted to do is like, just cancel the light, cancel the light with these names. And the only light that you see is the light that lets you register the person who died. This is like a view, of like a composite view of the entire ceiling, if you could see it all at once. And that's what the old barn looks like when you walk in there. So that's like all the time that I have, but I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, feel free to hang out and ask me questions if you have time. Thank you. Yes, Mario. Hi, Mario. How are you? Good, how are you? Um, I really like the autobiographical part of this that you incorporate yourself into it. And also the way that you talk about your community. I wonder if you could just tell us what it's like to um, move through the world with kind of these ideas with you all the time. I, like that's a, it's a good question and I don't, I've, I've sort of come to realize over time that that's where my ideas happen. Like some people like are shower ideas people, right? Like there's a lot of us that get ideas in the shower. I'm not saying the shower isn't a productive thinking place because it is. But for me, it's the commute. And it's like I have lived in Chicago since 2001. I've never owned a car. And the time 
that it takes me to traverse the city. I worked for a place called Art Resources and Teaching. It was a not-for-profit that did kind of art on a cart for public schools in Chicago. And I did that without a car. They sent me to like 103rd Street South. They sent me West. I learned the city. And so to just like have that time that's you're just I've allocated this time to my commute this is commute time now that's what it is and you just let yourself be present with that time instead of saying I'm going to be productive I'm going to get 10 other things done like I'm staring out the window I'm noticing that guy over there doing the thing I'm looking at how the light is hitting that building and so all of this I don't stare at it with the objective of like this is going to be my next piece it just filters in and becomes that yeah um, out of all these pieces, which one would you feel was the most difficult to uh, process? Which one would I feel is the most difficult to to like actually make or like to like conceive of? Which part? To what? Create. To create. Um, man, well, this was not a picnic. This particular eclipse. Um, I made it in the summer of 2016 and I went back and finished it in the winter of that year. And this old barn had ticks hanging out in the ceiling. Like you wouldn't believe I had like a tick a day. It was like, and plus like the climbing up in the ladder, coming back down, climbing up in the ladder, coming back down. I wanted to do and didn't do a floor intervention for this piece. As you can kind of see, like I tried sort of like mapping the sunlight that hit the floor. Um, but it rained and rained and rained and rained. So I'm out there in the rain trying to get this piece to work. And that was the hardest one on my body, I think, so far. All of them are pretty hard on my body, but that one was the hardest one. Yeah. Have you ever been interested in using any sort of uh, light-sensitive um, processes, like uh, cyanotypes or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the workshop that I'm doing later uses this really sweet paper that I think is kind of like engineered for kids called sun prints. Um, and it's kind of like cyanolite um, in that it doesn't involve, you know, heavy chemicals. But I, I, I like cyanotypes. I think my problem with them for my own very, very, very literal uh, sort of like way of processing the world is that you look at a cyanotype and you go, cool cyanotype. It never fools you for a second into thinking it's anything else. It's like cool cyanotype. Do you know what I'm saying? Ever. So if I wanted to sort of embrace the material objecthood of cyanotype, then it would make sense for me to explore that. And I am interested in it because there's something really satisfying about something not being a represented painted register, but an actual register. Like nobody made this. The light made this. You know what I'm saying? That's really satisfying. But the fact that it's so about I'm cyan, you know, like that bothers me. Thank you. Thank you.